The Unshackled Ways, episode 119. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. As you will recall, our last show was on the latest US political developments. No sooner had we recorded that show that the United States President Donald Trump made his comments about not wanting to take any more immigrants from what he termed shithole countries. As we've come to expect, these comments led to a new round of media hysteria and condemnation and, of course, accusations that Trump is a racist. Also, leaders from African nations have said how very offended they were by the comments. To discuss the fallout from this, we are joined once again by the Deputy Editor of The Unshackled and host of uh, Front and Centre podcast, Emilia Garcia, who is currently right next door to the United States in Mexico. Emilio, welcome back to the show. Thank you for having me. Second consecutive week. Happy to be here. Uh, well, the reason why we've ha- had you back, and I mentioned this in my introduction, as soon as we'd finished re- recording uh, this show, there was a another uh, U.S. politics firestorm with uh, United States President Donald Trump revealed uh, in ne- negotiations with Democrats over uh, the U.S.'s future immigration uh, policies said that he didn't want to take any more uh, immigrants from what he termed uh, shithole countries. <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, I think the only thing more, uh, the only person who said it louder than Donald Trump was CNN and MSNBC, uh, you know, ABC. They've basically been saying shithole 24-7 since the common broke. Yeah, uh, that, that's one of the side uh, issues of this, that you're allowed to say uh, shit or shithole on TV now. Uh, it's ridiculous, but I think, you know, they'll, they'll always make an exception when it comes to bashing uh, Donald Trump. I think, you know, CNN, basically, they have their standards, but as soon as soon as Donald Trump comes into the equation, let's, you know, let's adjust it a little bit. Let's, let's say whatever we need to say to get him uh, looking bad. Now, the media and uh, uh, those on the left, they, they, they always, uh, they, there's always something that Donald Trump says that they get outraged about, and they always claim that, oh, you know, this is the worst you know, thing that, you know, he's ever done and, oh, it's going to, you know, trigger the the end of his uh, presidency. Uh, yeah. Well, their, their claim about this is that, you know, using the term shithole countries, it's, oh, you know, blatantly racist. And, you know, CNN's Don Lemon, he, he you know, did this rant where he's like, you know, oh, people need to stop making excuses. Uh, uh, these comments, you know, they can't be described as, you know, anything other than racist and, like, you know, stop, you know, trying trying to uh, explain them away, where, you know, Trump, like, uh, everyone accepts that, you know, he used, you know, crass language, uh, you know, uh, wasn't yeah. the most, you know, diplomatic thing to f- put forward, but the the countries that he was referring to, uh, Haiti, which is uh, a Caribbean uh, country, and uh, also you know, Africa, uh, you know, they are, you know, countries with uh, low human development, and... Yeah, it's a, a lot of people. He, he, uh, Trump basically said, you know, what a, what a lot of people would say, you know, casually, you know, those countries are, yes. you know, shitholes. You know, uh, f- you know, it's it's not the most, uh, you know, politically correct term, but it's it's basically the truth. Right. I mean, you don't you don't want to, you know, live in those countries. I mean, they have, you know, low uh, f- you know, e- economic uh, development. There's a lot of, you know, violent crime there. There's a lot of uh, government uh, corruption. And it's fair to say that, uh, you know, people from those con- countries who immigrate to uh, nations like the United States, they bring a lot of their problems with them. Well, yeah, uh, I mean, that's... Uh, so there's several points to this, obviously. Uh, so the first thing that I would say, and I released an article about this a couple of days ago, is that I don't think that the comment was blatantly racist, but that doesn't make it okay. And I think that one of the issues is that we've kind of conflated, and I shouldn't say we, because I definitely don't don't consider myself in that camp, but people who are more on the left or the far left, basically, if something is wrong, then it has to be racist. If someone is a bad person, then they have to be racist, they have to be homophobic, and something can be wrong and not racist at the same time. So as they say, 
probably a lot of people who are outraged about this, you know, for political reasons, would have maybe used the term shithole at some point to describe this uh, and obviously have no racial animus towards black people or towards African people of any kind. Yet the president, you know, we have to keep a standard. I know that Donald Trump is not your typical president, but by saying, I would say it, you know, with my friends in my living room, doesn't mean that he should say it in the Oval Office with, uh, with lawmakers. So I think that the, the comment was completely off base. It shouldn't have been done. And, um, and another thing, yes, it's true that Heidi definitely has a very low uh, development index. Uh, another thing is that it's actually being uh, economically destroyed by all of the assistance. And what this means is basically none of the groups that went in there to assist after the horrible earthquake eight years ago have left. And so how is the economy supposed to grow if they're giving out rice for free? How are rice farmers going to get their products sold? If they are developing, basically everything's given away to the people for free, then how are businesses supposed to thrive? So obviously that also contributes to Heidi not being able to develop itself. And when it comes to African countries, well, that's painting, uh, uh, you know, just an incredibly diverse continent with a really large brush. You know, you have, of course, a lot of places where there is no government, where there is a lot of poverty, where, you know, there are children dying in the streets. But generally, the, 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 the countries within Africa that actually do have a government uh, are radically getting off of that train. Yes, they have a lot of problems. But there are also very uh, economically successful parts of Africa. For example, South Africa and Nigeria are complete economic uh, success stories. I mean, if you look at uh, Nigeria, the amount of people that have been lifted out of poverty, if you see all the things that are happening there, uh, I think that it would be a stretch to call it uh, even, you know, even to call it a poor country is kind of hard now, but to call it a shithole is also, or a shit house, which is apparently one of the defenses they're using, which I don't think is much of a defense. It's basically the same thing by a different term. Uh, so what, what what I'm trying to get at, and because it's just such a, uh, you kind of threw a lot of it at me at, 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 uh, from your first sentence, is that even though, yes, it's true that, you know, a lot of African countries don't have the same morals as we do in some Western countries, and we kind of need to watch out for that. We can't basically let people come in, uh, go somewhere and not, uh, you know, kind of hold our ethics. That's something to be afraid of. It's also kind of worrisome to have people coming in here who don't have the uh, wherewithal to develop economically, and then we're going to have to kind of step in and take care of them. That's obviously something we have to consider. But these things are all being conflated to that Trump was somehow justified, and it's not the case, even though I do not think it's racist. I can't read inside his mind and know if it's racist or not. Maybe it was. I don't think it was. But the comment was completely off base, in my opinion. Uh, the problem with uh, uh, Trump that if he, uh, we have to remember that this wasn't a you know public remark. He didn't you know tweet this. It was you know supposed to be in you know confidential negotiations. But because it's Trump, mm -hmm. uh, you know the the Democrats who are in that meeting have you know no hesitation in uh, you know reporting that uh, to the media and uh, all of these you know pol uh, politicians. Uh, you know, they, they speak in this, you know, uh, crass, you know, rude, uh, aggressive language, you know, all, all the time. Like if, if, if the public, uh, you know, had a glimpse of how politicians, you know, spoke to each other, you know, behind the scenes, they'd be horrified. But, you know, because it's uh, Trump, it filters uh, to the media and he's made out to be the, you know, the, the, the worst, you know, politician uh, there ever was. So there's that as well. Trump, uh, Trump never meant for this to, you know, get out in into into the public and i don't think if you know because because he said this it was reported you know during a period of you know f frustration you know because the you know negotiations weren't uh, going well i don't uh, you know so you talked about you know some you know african uh nations you know are, are doing well i doubt that you know trump was uh you know, making out that it was, you know, every, you know, African nation was bad. But yeah, right. if you look at the Human Development Index, which is the, the United Nations one, uh, all the all the nations with, uh, you know, low uh, human development, uh, they all, you know, come from uh, Africa. Um, the United States is uh, 10th. Uh, uh, Haiti also has a, a low uh, hu a human development index. So it is... It, it, you know, it, 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 although you know, I do agree that you know, yeah, using using it's not the right term to use, and uh, a lot of you know uh, conservatives said that you know this you know wasn't the right word to use. It is you know overall, it is true that you know these these countries that Trump was referring to, they're you know they're not you know great places to to live. 
Yeah, naturally. I mean, um, th this is this is true. I mean, I don't think anyone is trying to say, oh no, you know, uh, <laughs> Heidi is the most wonderful place to live. You know, it's it's perfect. It's even better than the U.S. or than Australia. Of course not. Uh, but I think that this misses the point a lot uh, because, I mean, for example, right now, and I knew this was going to happen on Twitter. Uh, people have taken to basically justifying what Trump has said by saying categorically that these countries are shitholes, right? So they, you know, they, and it's kind of nasty. They, they're putting out pictures of like extreme poverty and like a lot of garbage and a lot of things like that and saying like, yeah, well, it, it is, you know, really economically depressed. Like, yeah, no one's denying that. We're not, and that, that's one of the issues that people are saying. You can't categorically say it is a shithole or not a shithole. There's no category of shithole. You know, it's, it's, not, it's, not, a, it's not a standard. It's, uh, it, it was basically a, a slander. Uh, so that's obviously not the question. And not, another thing that people were doing is saying, well, if the countries aren't shitholes, then why are people leaving? And to that answer, I would direct them to the 8.5 million Americans who are living outside of the U.S. Or to the 400,000 Australians who are living out of the United States. Or the 300,000 Swedes who are living outside of Sweden. Uh, you know, it, it's, just, it's just one of these things that, it, 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 that, that it's, it's being badly looked at. The idea is not to say whether Trump was accurate or not in his depiction of Heidi. Heidi is obviously very economically depressed. A lot of Africa is clearly very economically depressed. Corruption, crime, all of this is true. But the issue is, you can't say it is or isn't. That's subjective. It was, it was an insult. It was a slander. Probably done, you know, behind closed doors, as you say. Maybe it shouldn't have been taken uh, quite as aggressively as it has. But the idea is not to say whether or not these countries are good or bad. The issue is that the president of the United States was saying this to a group of lawmakers, some of them opposed him strongly, and he said this, and it wasn't the place, and it wasn't the time, and he probably shouldn't be saying this with people that aren't of extreme trust because he's the president of the frickin' United States of America. He's the most important political figure probably of the world. So I think that this, these are one of the issues that they're getting confused. Yes, what he said may not have been completely inaccurate, but he shouldn't be calling country shitholes. He's the president. A lot of the memes that I've uh, seen uh, shared around the internet in uh, relation to Trump's comments has been, you know, criticizing these, you know, lefties and celebrities, you know, saying, well, you know, if these countries, you know, are so good as you claim you, why don't you move there? Or, you know, why, why are, you know, so many people leaving those countries or they, you know, won't, won't go back there? And, uh, you know, the, the memes have always said, you know, yeah. because they're, they're shitholes, it's, it's okay for, uh, you know, lefties to say how horrible you know, the, these countries are, but, you know, when Trump says it, oh, it's, you know, horrible and racist. Absolutely. I mean, that's, that's just one. Of, I mean, obviously, it's, it's kind of a, more of a joke than a serious point, but it's essentially true. You know, obviously, I'm sure that, uh, that you know, there, there are a ton of lefties, all these celebrities are probably sitting around saying, you know, that they would never, you know, be caught dead in one of these countries where, you know, they, they, they don't have access to, like, extremely luxurious uh, hotels or anything like that. Uh, whether or not it's a, it's a real serious point, I would go towards no, because obviously the, the answer to that is, well, because I live here, because this is where my money is, and because I just don't want to move, you know? And I, by the way, a lot of, a lot of these uh, lefty celebrities actually do have um, summer homes and things in, uh, in these countries. So I get your point. Uh, I don't know if it's, uh, if it's so much of a serious point. I think it's more of a, of a funny joke and a funny way to make a point. But, you know, why, don't, why doesn't anyone move anywhere? It's just, you know, because because their life is there. Uh, but, you know, obviously I'm never going to be one to defend uh, the lefties, especially the Hollywood celebrities, uh, virtue signaling about these issues. You know, they're they are some of the most uh, hypocritical people, out of touch people that, you know, you can think of. And to have them think, you know, to have them uh, comment on these things is a pretty ridiculous. Then you have, you know, the, the leaders of African nations saying how very offended they are that, you know, uh, Trump would say this. And uh, it's like, it's a bit rich for you to get, you know, high and mighty, uh, you know, on, on yeah. the world stage, given that you're, you know, a, a lot of you are corrupt. Uh, you're, you're overseeing yes. you know, uh, countries where, um, you know, the, the economy economic freedom, personal freedoms, you know, uh, right. are, pre are pretty much trampled, you know, all the time there's, you know, uh, rampant crime. Uh, so, you know, it's, and the mainstream media is putting them on a pedestal saying, you know, look at these virtuous African leaders, which is like, uh, that's, <laughs> that's just mm -hmm. atrocious. Um, yeah. I mean, these people, you know, are obviously incredibly corrupt uh, human beings. They, obviously place their riches and their, uh, you know, kind of benefits and the benefits of their political allies above the good of the people. But again, this is one of the things of uh, just kind of being 
politically motivated. Whenever you can go to you know attack your political opposition, it's going to be better. And you know what we've seen now with uh, this move by the Democrats to say what Trump said in that meeting was actually quite brilliant if you think about it, because essentially what was happening is that they were going to have to kind of work out this deal with DACA, which is the deferred arrival, uh, the deferred action for childhood arrivals program which essentially lets people who arrive here as children stay in the U.S. under tr- temporary visas and give them a uh, right to work. The Democrats want a clean bill, which means we're going to just let them stay here, as Trump wants to do, by the way, and not, uh, not include anything that has to do with border security, mainly the wall. Donald Trump says, no, you have to give me something, so I want to build a wall, and then I'll let the, the dreamers stay, which uh, the dreamers, uh, for any Australians who don't know that term, is... Uh, is the, the people who are covered under DACA status. And so right now, they clearly both want different things, and Trump was playing hardball, and it seemed like he was going to win. Now, politically, they have the upper hand because they've just shown an instance of racial animus as soon as they're negotiating whether uh, brown people can come into the country, to put it blat- blatantly. And obviously, Donald Trump is no longer in control of these negotiations. He's no longer in control of the narrative. And I think that that was actually quite quite brilliant of the of the Democrats, though it's just not very authentic. I don't think that Nancy Pelosi is actually sitting there thinking, this guy's a racist. I just don't think so. I don't think that a lot of people that are cl- claiming that these comments were uh, anything else and Donald Trump just being, you know, saying something stupid it, is, is the fact. But, you know, politically, it's a battle. And I think that in this case, they, they packed a really huge punch. Well, politically, it might be a good move for the Democrats, but uh, they also sh- should have considered, you know, the the United States, you know, reputation on the on the world stage. Because, you know, even, even though you know Donald Trump's the president, like he's president of the, yeah. the United States, and these, uh, you know, Democrats, they should, you know, also, you know, think about, you know, it's it's not good for the country as a whole to have, you know, all of these other countries around the world and the United Nations, you know, start uh, to use to use another uh, crass terminology, uh, shitting on the United States. I mean... Yeah, uh, exactly. I, I agree with you. I think uh, a lot of the times, though, politicians aren't really thinking of the country first, if we're being honest. And, I mean, another point to uh, the Democrats' defense, not that I like doing that, but I will, is that uh, actually abroad, Donald Trump does have very low approval ratings. So it actually kind of helps them with their political allies to kind of shit on Trump because as long as they can make Donald Trump look bad and like he's always on the verge of impeachment, he they might actually have more support from their allies. And I mean, this is shown, for example, right now uh, during his potential now non-trip to London, to the UK. It was going to go, everything was planned out, and obviously as soon as, you know, he's already radically unpopular there, but as soon as that uh, came out, obviously uh, the British government started to hear for there might be riots in the street, uh, you know, pending Trump's arrival. And so, you know, he tweeted out that he, <laughs> I don't know, that he said that he had canceled the because uh, he want. I, I don't actually know what he said. He tweeted it out. But clearly, you know, he was asked by the government uh, of the UK not to go, and he's trying to flip it, but I think, you know, uh, the, it seems like right now some um, establishment uh, political people from both countries, or from many countries, are actually helping each other out against Trump. Yeah, I thought that, you know, Trump's, you know, official reasoning of why he didn't go, that, uh, the you know, the embassy was uh, moved, and, you know, I didn't want to stay in it, and he blamed Obama for it when it was actually Bush who uh, relocated <laughs> the, uh, the embassy, right. so... Uh, the, uh, that was, you know, a huge uh, bl- a blunder on his part not to not to get that right. Uh, it did come across as, you know, basically elitist. Like, well, I'm not going to stay in this, you know, crummy new embassy. Like, like that was the whole yeah. reason you can't cancel the trip. I mean, uh, uh, yeah. And you know, the the UK is, uh, you know, one of, um, you know, the United States, you know, most important, you know, allies. It's, you know, oh. part of the the ang- Anglosphere. Um, you know. And they're also, you know, a crucial uh, nation when it comes to, you know, f- the same, you know, foreign policy goals, you know, fighting ISIS and, um, you know, dealing with terrorism at home. Yeah. Yeah, no, 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 absolutely. I mean, um, to say that this is a happy moment for Donald Trump politically is uh, a, is an understatement. 
the the fact of the matter though is also you know you have Donald Trump you know he he's he's made mistakes before he's come off as elitist you know he's starting to alienate some of his base some of his face are obviously never going to leave but uh, I remember this one speech where he was saying uh, you know he was at this rally you know obviously unscripted and he was saying you know I went to better school than the elites I live in a nicer apartment than the elites I got better grades than the elites and now I live in the White House and, he, and then he says I guess maybe they're not the elites I guess we're the elites and it's like no, dude, you're just saying that you're an elite and everyone there is making less than $100,000 a year. So, I mean, Donald Trump, obviously, you know, he, he, he's not, he's an elitist because he's an elite and, you know, he kind of has a hard time, you know, uh, making himself look a, a, like a person of the people for obvious reasons. Um, but yeah, I mean, to alienate, especially the UK, which is such a close-knit ally, is obviously not uh, politically intelligent or politically convenient, you know, to have uh, all these conflicts with the UN even though it plays well to uh, to his base, is obviously not a good thing. You want to have as much power as you can within the UN, uh, and you want to influence as many parts of the UN, and he's obviously been excluding himself. So actually, when it comes to his foreign policy recently, especially when it comes to kind of picking fights and having people have to oppose him politically to seem strong, it seems like he's actually working against himself. And I, I think that especially considering the uh, America first and, you know, America being the most powerful, number one, whatever, he's actually kind of working against himself here. I know that I know that we're not supposed to intervene in other countries, and that's part of what um, Donald Trump was uh, intervening in. But it seems that what he's actually doing is he's reducing some of our perceived powers abroad while kind of uh, contradicting himself when it comes to when it, can, it comes to um, intervention in other countries, you know, he's expanded the amount of troops on the ground and everything. And yeah, granted, he has had great, great success with um, with ISIS. Well, at least his general has. But at the same time, he is kind of going against what he said that he was going to do. So right now, I mean, I think that it's it's kind of um, hard to see sometimes how Donald Trump is affecting himself because. It's so polarized that you know any any uh, criticism from the left seems to be uh, ridiculous bullshit, uh, you know, kind of aggrandized. But at the same time, you know, he, uh, the the common people, the people that aren't you know involved in alt media, the people that aren't in politics, are getting very turned off by a lot of the things he's doing. And you know, it's going to be a problem come twenty twenty, also twenty eighteen. Uh, but it's also a huge paradox that, like, uh, it seems like, you know, watching the, the mainstream media and, you know, uh, you know, just, you know, Donald Trump's Twitter feed and, you know, the, the back and forth between, you know, various, uh, you know, politicians and public figures he has that the United States is a nation in turmoil where if you're, you know, just a layperson getting on with your day to day job, like the United States is actually you know, getting better, you know, the economy is, uh, you know, improving the, you know, uh, government, you know, it's, it's still, you know, functioning, you know, well, you know, day, day, right. day to day. And yeah, there, there's this huge disconnect between, you know, what's, you know, re uh, what's how the United States is really uh, running and, you know, how it's, you know, perceived as, as running. And that's, and it seems to be that, you know, U US politics, it's, it's more just become, you know, a, a sideshow to, you know, reality. Uh, absolutely. But that's one of the things, and, uh, you know, my podcast is called Front and Center. I try to take the center point. Right now, I agree that the mainstream media, mostly liberal outlets, are <clears throat> completely disconnected from reality. And what they're saying has no base in truth, and they exaggerate things and everything. But, I mean, let's take into consideration during the um, Obama years, it wasn't like... Fox News was not guilty of this. Uh, we had a lot of very good um, uh, economic numbers towards the end of the presidency. And if you watch Fox News, you would basically think that the economy of the US was in a shithole, you know, to use Trump's words. So I think that uh, the, the issue more than anything when it comes to the, the separation between what, uh, what people are living and what the numbers say versus what the political opposition to the uh, establishment say has more to do with partisanship than anything else. And obviously right now, uh, the media is largely controlled by the left. And so you, you see right now it's more enshrined and it's more obvious that, uh, that this bias exists. But it really does exist everywhere. I mean, the fact of the matter that, you know, you had uh, Marco Rubio, one of the presidential candidates in 2016, saying that we could not afford to have another four years like the last eight years that it was, you know, the, the economy was in the shithole and it was awful and, oh, my God, the whole world's going to come to an end. That was also that was also a blatant mischar mischaracterization. It's a guy who thinks that Obama was a terrible president. I can say that it was very exaggerated. So I think we're kind of, you know, the, the disconnect comes more from partisanship and from uh, just wanting to see whatever you want to see and wanting to, you know, bring up numbers uh, for your station. 
uh, more than just you know the left being the left. I mean, uh, uh, the challenge for for Trump when it comes to yeah the twenty eighteen midterms and twenty twenty, if is if he is able to you know cut through this you know media hysteria about you know how we're in the most you know turbulent times ever, and you know he's just able to say you know look at all these you know good things that I've done, and you know he you know say that you know I've done all the things that you know I've promised to do, and and I think the reason why he uh, you know, really lost his temper in these negotiations is because, you know, he, he needs to, you know, build the wall. That's that's the key thing that is missing, you know, from uh, his agenda at the moment. You know, the wall, you know, is not being built, let alone it's not even, you know, funded yet. If if that if that's not built um, and, he'll, and he figures out, you know, some, you know, way to, you know, have Mexico pay for it, it'll be, you know, through some, um, you know, negotiate, renegotiated, you know, aid package uh yeah. something like that uh that is the you know the the one thing that he needs like i think that you know his base could you know live with you know say obamacare still being in place i mean uh you know he's he's based on as you know free market as the you know establishment republicans are but you know they want that wall built i suppose i mean that's one of the things that you know uh, i, I kind of try to take my own biases out of these because obviously as being half Mexican, I, I, I just have some animus toward the wall on its own. Uh, obviously, I kind of think of the fact that Mexico has a wall on its southern border <clears throat> to keep people out. So, you know, how dare we kind of, you know, you know say that that's uh, such a horrible thing. But on the other hand, you know, when it comes to the wall, a couple of things. First of all, Donald Trump did something amazing. He managed to have the third world country of Mexico, who is on, which is only the 14th richest country in the world, somehow have a greater advantage towards the United States. They have said that they're not going to pay for the wall, and that has made Donald Trump look really bad, especially in that leaked uh, conversation with Peña Nieto. And so, you know, he says, well, then I'll cancel the uh, North American Free Trade Agreement, which, you know, people think is a huge bargaining chip. It's actually not as big as you would think. Why? Because, yes, it's true that the U.S. buys uh, most of Mexico's exports, but 52% of the exports from Mexico are, are um, outside of the NAFTA nego- uh, NAFTA standards, so they, they benefit not for, like not at all, right? And a lot of the things that you know would have to be taxed from Mexico, it's impossible to get them from anywhere else. So, really, you would be passing the cost onto the consumer. So it's unbelievable that right now it seems that Mexico is kind of like you know Mexico, who has always kind of had to appease the United States and play to their you know and kind of play to their strengths and always want to be on their good side. Now actually couldn't give less of a shit what they do, you know, they, they're, it's created a lot of animus. And the fact of the matter is that Donald Trump knows that he's not going to get Mexico to pay for the wall, he said it himself. Why do we need a wall? It's just because he wants to get reelected. Do we need a wall? There's probably better things to take care of it. You know, we've, there, there's conflicting uh, narratives on this, but we know that there are probably better ways to put $18,000 to, $18 billion, $18 billion to work when it comes to border security. But for Trump supporters, for people who voted for him, that wall is symbolic. It, doesn't, it, it really doesn't have to do with border security. It doesn't really have to do with less drugs in the United States. It's symbolic. It's us creating that barrier between Mexico and the U.S. And it's a campaign promise that Donald Trump you know, said that, you know, it's kind of like, here, here it is. You know, all these, uh, you know, uh, high-minded uh, liberals said that we weren't going to get it done and we will get it done. But honestly, it just seems like I might be wrong. And it wouldn't be the first time, but I don't think it's going to get built. It was interesting during my research for this episode that, yeah, Mexico has a high human uh, development index. Like the, the stereotype of Mexico is that, you know, if you walk out on yeah. the street, you're going to get decapitated. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I, I would, I would uh, encourage anyone who's listening right now to just go on to Google and look up uh, Mexico City, to look up Oaxaca, to look up. Right now, I'm in Mexico City, and I've had a couple of friends from Australia here and they are just blown away. It's an incredibly big city. You know, it's the seventh richest city in the world. Uh, it's richer than than Sydney, believe it or not. Melbourne. It's uh, you know, there's only two two cities in the U.S. that are richer than Mexico City. And it's uh, you know, we have very good roads. We have uh, you know, water. You know, we have 99 uh, percent literacy. And that's one. That's obviously one of the things that, um, for example, people are upset about when it comes to Trump's comments. That uh, even though, and you know, we shouldn't really look into it that much. He was just saying something that got blown up. But countries are 
a lot more complex than you would think. You know, Nigeria probably, you know, yes, it is very poor and they have very economically depressed areas. I'm sure once you get there, you would be surprised to see the, the development, the roads, the, the, the nightlife, everything that, that, you know, you would never uh, think of a place like that. So it's kind of good to, you know, kind of uh, keep the, those things into consideration. Uh, and especially when it comes to Mexico, I'm just plugging Mexico here because obviously I, I'm biased towards it. Uh, you know, 200 countries GDP is measured. We're number 14. There's only 17 that have more than a trillion dollars in their in their uh, in their GDP. Pretty spectacular. Now, not to say we don't have our issues, but you know, there's a reason. You know, there's a reason that right now Mexicans aren't immigrating to the U.S. It's mostly Central and South Americans. So yeah, it's it's uh, it's an interesting point. So it's not actually true that you know there's still floods of you know Mexicans crossing the border to the United States. So no, mostly, and this is something that was brought up uh, repeatedly when uh, during the uh, the debates, I don't know why that word slipped my mind, during the 2016 debates, uh, essentially, no, Mexicans are not going in large numbers to to the U.S. In fact, right now, it seems that there are more Mexicans leaving the United States than coming back. There's opportunity here. There's a lot of uh, new industry. There's a lot of jobs. Wages are going up. Uh, it's, it, right now, we're doing okay. Uh, even though, you know, the peso took a hit, obviously, because of Donald Trump's win, we're doing okay. Mostly, all of the, all of the, uh, immigration from South America is from Ecuador, it's from Venezuela, it's, uh, you know, from a lot of way more depressed, way poorer countries that obviously have to get through Mexico to reach the U.S. Now, one would say uh, that there are a billion better ways to get, um, to, to secure the border. That is true than a wall, of course. Another thing, a larger percentage of people overstay their visas than cross the border illegally. So that's also something that has to be taken care of. I mean, there are just all of these complexities around the reason that people are going into the United States from Mexico that are just so oversimplified by the wall that it's kind of hard to get behind it, uh, really. I mean, a lot of a lot of countries have walls on their borders, but they weren't built this century. They were built when you know it was impossible to build to buy a ladder, you know, from a trillion places in Tijuana. And just climb over it because it's obviously impossible to you know surveil the whole border. So it's not really going to buy them that much time. The, the, the issue is, and I know that, that it's symbolically important to a lot of people, but I would say that if if they if their interest was really in securing the border, which is important, I, this whole thing about people saying that anyone should be able to come in to the United States is absolutely erroneous. It's a it's a sovereign country and should be able to control who goes in. But if your interest is really in getting people, the best people, into the United States in curbing illegal immigration, in making sure that people aren't bringing drugs in. Look at the different alternatives. Look at what $18 billion can do. And then think, is the wall the best option? Even though Donald Trump, you know, it's fun to chant, build the wall and whatever, and you know, you had those frat boys in Cancun yelling it, they got the shit beat out of them, <laughs> naturally. Um, is that the best option? I would say no. Right now, especially with, the, with how he kind of, uh, you know, screwed the pooch with the shithole comment. I don't think that he holds a lot of bargaining power for it. And another thing is that Republicans don't want it. And Republicans don't want to leave NAFTA either. So it just seems like an upstream battle. But Mexico has a, a, border, a southern border wall as well. You just mentioned before, didn't you? Yes. I, yeah, it does. But again, this was built decades ago. This was built before, you know, we had the amazing modern technology. And, you know, Mexico, another point is that Mexico is one of the country that is worse to its illegal immigrants. Uh, I mean, if you, if, if, you know, one day you should, uh, I, would, I would suggest that anyone that's listening to this look into how Mexico treats its illegal immigrants. It's, uh, it's a humanitarian crisis. It's absolutely awful. There is absolute gender, prof uh, gender uh, racial profiling. Uh, there's a, just a lot of nefarious things that happen. So again, this is what I try to kind of put into perspective. You know, it's not like we are innocent in any of this. And it's not like, you know, you don't have an interest in making sure that the border is secure because, you know, yes, maybe you just have, you know, uh, a mom and two kids wanting to find a better life for themselves and they're not an immediate threat. But then you also have some incredibly violent gangs and uh, drug dealers that are, you know, going to do bad things in the United States. And, you know, it's, it's not unreasonable to say that you want to secure the border. The issue is, how are we going to do this? What makes sense? And who are we actually trying to keep out? People are like, no, we can't have all these Mexicans coming in. It's like, they're leaving. <laughs> all the Mexicans are leaving. Like, actually, and I think that if we're going to talk, if we're going to have an honest, good conversation about this, we should at least know what the subject matter contains. You have to concede, though, the reason why the conversation we're having right now doesn't uh, take place is not because of, you know, Donald Trump's rhetoric. It's because, you know, 
the the Mexican you know government and people are you know uh, defensive to to what he says. They're not saying, look, it's not our people coming over the border. It's you know these people coming from Latin American countries. Look, we're trying to deal with them the best they, best they could, and you know offer to you know work with the United States to you know stop them you know coming through the United States. It's it's you know how dare you say this about you know me Mexicans? You know we're we're not going to cooperate at all. Like it's you know. It's a two-pronged problem. Absolutely, the the Mexican government. I mean, one of the things you know, this is one of the differences between government and country. Is obviously we're not our government. Our government is a piece of garbage. They are extremely corrupt, extremely violent. There is a huge amount of of uh, extremely nefarious things that go on in the government. And obviously, you know, um, working with uh, having the U.S. work with the Mexican government is an issue. However. Uh, and I, I will concede to that. I have I have no interest in defending the government, the president, the past president, any of it. The issue is that right now you're actually you know it, when it comes to uh, to immigration and to securing the border, you might kind of be working against yourself yourselves. You're not from the U.S. Uh, Trump might be working against himself and against the U.S. because we had made tremendous strides as uh, as when it comes to securing the border to attacking. Um, the the gangs that are trying to cross into the United States, all these things. For a while, the Mexican government was, wasn't doing anything about it. You know, we had kind of our arrangements with the cartels, and we were letting them kind of do whatever they wanted. And it wasn't until we had some serious negotiations and we started establishing some really uh, clear uh, coordination that the government finally started to crack down on this and started to assist the U.S. government in securing the border and making sure that people aren't coming in and making sure that there aren't as many tunnels. All these things finally had happened where the Mexican government and the United States government were working together, mostly because the United States government was doing so much to cooperate with Mexico. They were giving them more resources. They were giving them money. They were giving them uh, weapons, cars, all these things. Now it's all being walked back. And now there's a tremendous animus. And so we're going to get back to the point where the Mexican government won't do anything about it. Because they don't care about this stuff. All they care about is, you know, holding power and staying rich. So, you know, it's again, this is one of the one of the points. I try not to be too uh, biased, but it's hard for me to find one of the, one of the really good points about um, about Trump's uh, immigration plan. The only thing I will say, obviously, now it's on people's minds. Now we're actually talking about it honestly for a while, which is kind of like a second tier discussion. But it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to kind of try to alienate the people that we want to work with us to try and curb this problem. Well, maybe that's why uh, that's an argument in favor of building the wall. If you can't get cooperation from, from Mexico, then uh, basically the, the wall is your best option. Uh, but I've enjoyed the discussion where we've had today, uh, Emilio, with uh, Oh, we've gone from, you know, shithole countries to, uh, yeah, talking a bit about Mexico. So it was a good chat. Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Yeah. And I'm sure probably next week there'll be another uh, U.S. political firestorm because everyone's forgotten about Fire and Fury. Like, what, what was that that was discussing last week? Yeah, and uh, it, it turns out to be the least important political story uh, probably of the last two years. But uh, yeah, it's being you know chalked up to be the you know the, the impeachable offense. Someone else's book is Trump's impeachable offense. But yeah, it's uh, kind of ridiculous. Yeah, uh, uh... All right, everybody, that's the show for today. I'd like to remind you all once again to vote in the 2017 Unshackler Awards. There are ten awards with ten nominees in each category, with the winners determined by a poll of our followers and announced on Australia Day. Two more categories have just been posted. There is the Cis White Male Award and the Triggered Feminist Award, so make sure you have your say. Our friend Dave Palau from Church and State is holding his first major event, the Church and State Summit uh, 2018, which is on the 23rd to 24th of February in Brisbane, which will feature many high-profile speakers, including Margaret Court and former Deputy Prime Minister John Anderson. Another upcoming event is that the Unshackled will be present at the Free Speech Rally hosted by the newly formed Australian Freedom of Speech Movement, which will be held in Melbourne at the State Library of Victoria on February 24th at 1pm. It aims to take a stand against the stifling of free speech in Australia, both in our laws and through political correctness, so I hope many of you can make it. Thanks once again for your company and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at The Unshackled
unshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.